Uh, Mick Worthington, welcome to Time Team Tea Time. I have a memory, Mick, of us being somewhere in Shropshire. And I've got a feeling that you and the rest of the diggers were sleeping on Mark Horton's floor. Yeah, that would be much, yeah, that'd be much Wenlock. We basically, I, I don't think the, the, the TV company really realised that they needed archaeologists. So they basically got Mark to bring some of his students um, to which Wenlock. And we basically just camped in his house and Mark's wife ran away. <laughs> she just ran out the door because she couldn't stand all these people in her house. And we basically camped in Mark's, Mark's house the whole three days and had basically a lot of a crazy party at Bangalore <laughs> whilst you guys were doing whatever you were doing. We had no idea what you were doing. There's lots of equipment everywhere, I remember. And we were just like, I have no idea what this stuff is. So yeah, we had a great time. <laughs> I remember sort of coming in one morning and there were just bodies over the floor. It looked like something from the Blitz. That's um, right, though. And and I remember that shoot very well with for the joys of various moments in which Mick um, decided we'd actually been digging in the wrong place for a day or two, looked over the fence and said, we should be digging next door. And, That's right. Uh, we, had, we had to shuffle to the next door neighbour's house. And I think the original guy wasn't desperately happy about it, but... Um, I rather, it was a very memorable shoot that, partly because Mark was involved, uh, the estimable Professor Horton as he was then, um, yeah. who spent a fair time. I'm interested, Mick, about diggers. Um, do you think being a digger on, you did 50 time team programs uh, right. or more? Yeah. What was it that that made Time Team different, apart from the sheer panic of it? Was there a specific skill that you had to have that helped you get through the whole craziness of a three-day shoot? Well, in some ways, the, sh the, the, the digging we did on Time Team wasn't that different to what I was doing commercially. I was working in a commercial lab, a commercial, not lab in those days, I work in a lab now. I, went in the com I worked for a commercial unit back in those days. And we'd basically arrive on site and we'd only have three days. Some bulldozers had arrived on a site to knock them down and we were basically scurrying around in front of it trying to record what we can. So for me, Time Team wasn't such a big shock. There were camera crews and it was great catering, but Day to day, it was very similar to what I was already doing. A lot of archaeologists were doing sort of researchy stuff, got upset. But for me, it was it was what I was doing. So I find it was it, for me, it was just okay. This is just another job, and it was for for me very much like that. I quite like the fact of we we would go all sorts of places. So one of the places we went to was Ribchester, and we yeah. often have a mixture of people there local archaeologists with the local county archaeologists and their diggers and our diggers and I always found it really useful to have people that we knew sort of working alongside everybody because sometimes what was going on in the trenches wasn't always blind and obvious to me or the director or whatever and we could come to you, you guys and ask you what you know is this real are we are we going fast enough what do you think yeah, I think that was. I think that's one of the main reasons that you had to have your own archaeologist because I think the local people, they, the camera crews arrived. It was a big shock. They didn't know what was going on. It would take them a day, a day and a half to get used to it. And some people, it was natural for them, but, but most people couldn't understand what was going on. It was shocking. It was stressful. So by having us, we could hold people's hands and say, "Okay, it's okay, fine. It's only camera crew. There is catering. It's okay," <laughs> <laughs> and just calm people down a bit. And also keep your eyes open. A lot of my job actually wasn't really digging. It was actually making sure what we were finding um, got onto camera. And I'd be looking around the site and seeing something being dug and say, hey, guys, let's just slow down a bit here. Let's just leave that alone. I know, I know you want to dig it, but just leave it alone for five minutes. I would get, you know, on my comms, I had, I had a walkie-talkie like Mick and everybody else did, and I would ring into the director and say, hey, guys, we're finding such and such. You, you should get a crew out here. So I would do a lot of sort of stopping digging and also making people go fast come on guys this is not good enough we've got to get this done by lunchtime i know the camera crew is coming out after lunch we have to no, and they would just no no we got yes you have to do it come on guys so people and, hated me uh, do you remember uh, the, you know do you remember a moment when you actually found something on camera what was the first artifact object site bit of mosaic 
where you actually thought, well, now I've done it. I've actually found something and all this paraphernalia of cameras and things has actually recorded it. I was much more in my role because I was sort of exploration supervisor and I'm more the liaison between you guys and the archaeologists. My job was to make sure that we as a TV company got what we wanted. So as an archaeologist, I was much, I wasn't that, quite often I didn't dig at all on a shoot. You know, I'd be making people dig. I'd be running around all the trenches making sure that we were finding stuff. So I can't think of anything. I'm sure tomorrow it'll come to me. I'll wake up in the morning. Oh, Tim, I should have said such and such. But I can't think of anything. I think it's, I think it's rather marvellous you managed to blag your way into a sort of middle management role so early <laughs> in, in the um, And you, um, you went to Nevis, didn't you? And digging in Nevis was was a, another bag of tricks altogether. I mean, it was just in, obviously incredibly hot. There were spiders coming out of the trenches. That's right. Tarantula yeah. spiders <laughs> working their way. <laughs> spiders came in. Uncle Phil went out the other way. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> what do you remember about Nevis, Nick? I loved Nevis. I thought it was one of my one of my favourite digs. You know, it was a great dig. The, the, the archaeology was unbelievable. I never realised there was, you know, steam. I spent at that point 10 years um, studying steam engines in Colbertdale. And all of a sudden I ended up and basically just there's stone bases or brick bases. And we out in the Caribbean and the damn thing's just sitting there. There's, there's a steam engine that came out of Bolton and Watts factory in, in Birmingham, just <laughs> sitting there. It was like, what? Why didn't they come here earlier? I actually, after I left Time Team, I went to the Caribbean and worked for a couple of years, dude. Did excavate, did field schools and things out there. So right. that was really a change, and I really, really enjoyed that day. It was great stuff. And what was nice about what was strange about that? I think the first day, as we were ex, we were doing an estate, uh, a, a, a sugar estate there, and we began to find materials from Bristol, like Bristol blue glass. Yeah. And do you remember the Staffordshire guy we had, David, who was an expert on transfer ware? And he yes. was saying, oh, yeah, that was a dinner service sent out to these characters. So they yeah. had the best dinner service, Bristol glass, wine, and all the rest of it. And yeah. we, had, we, we, had, we did two programs there. What other, which parts of the dig did you get involved in? Where were you digging mainly? So on the on the first program when we were at um, Mount Travis, I think it was called. Yeah, was it Pinners Pinners Estate? I think. Estate, yeah. So I was basically, I think I was in the counting house, and I was basically around the house. Stuart went off and did some crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, I basically was working there, and then the next dig we did it on Coconut Grove. It was called, which yeah. was a, a um, Native American Native American site, Amerindian site. On the on the on the beach, it was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And basically, that one we were digging um, in in the town. I think we actually found. I think that was a really good find. We actually found um, some kind of occupation site, possibly buildings from, from that from the period, which was like never been done before, which was pretty amazing. And then, of course, the hurricane came in and washed the dig away. So we just I lost. I literally went for lunch, came back, and my dig the hole was like two meters square had disappeared. It'd gone. The storm had come in and just, just filled the hole up. So that was, that was a good day. <laughs> I, I also remember we were working with some of the local people. I remember Charlie helping us out. Uh, yes. And he used to take us off, take Stuart off and say, I think you should be looking. And I remember we found the remnants of a village that was quite near to that main house where actually the slaves had lived. Yes. And and one of the lovely things, we're going to be showing this this Sunday. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's the first one or the second one, but they found some tiny remains of blue and white pottery cut into gaming pieces to act yes. as, uh, you know, gaming pieces for the guys who were the slaves living in the village, essentially. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that was good. I think Stuart's work on that was pretty amazing because that jungle, you can't really see it on camera. I've worked, I subsequently worked in the Caribbean quite a lot. That jungle is really, really hard to work in. It's really thick, it's dense, it, and it's trying to kill you all the time with spiky <laughs> stuff, snakes and stuff. But the stuff Stuart did was pretty, pretty phenomenal because we you know we, did, we had our site cleared before we got there so we could just do our normal archaeology, although it was very hot. 
So I think Stuart's work on that was was pretty good. Was, was, was not than Stuart. <laughs> Absolutely, and and I also remember Jenny, um, you know, coming appearing one morning, and she'd been bitten by every mosquito around. I mean, she was covered in bites, um, and she still soldiered on. It was quite a quite a. Well, I think. Yeah. The thing about the caffeine is whenever you go, you have to take somebody with you who the mosquitoes like yes. so that you else get bit. And unfortunately, that ticket was Jenny. So <laughs> We should make the point that for us, you know, Mick the Dig became Mick the Twig. Right, yeah. what we called you when you became a dendrochronologist. Um, and I think I found that, I, I find we've done quite a bit of dendrochronology. When people talk about it, what, you know, people who aren't archaeologists or whatever, it's often referred to as absolute dating, uh, if I'm right, right. in the yeah. sense that why is it that, that dendro can be so, like one of the most accurate dating things we have? It is, it is the most accurate dating thing we have. Um, basically because we can tell when the tree was felled, where all the other ones are date ranges, no 20 years, 30 years, 40,000 know, years. So all the other dating techniques have this range. Well, when we're working and we have the right samples and we have the right trees um, and the right timbers, sorry, we can come down to exactly when that tree was was cut within a few months. The, the tree's cut and then sometimes it's matured for a while. No. 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 Okay. no well, if you go, if you go, I watched the Langorse program this morning. And if you look at the Langorse program, um, because I forgot about I, you were talking about you and I were talking about Time Team yesterday. I was thinking, I can't remember anything about Time Team. It's so long ago. I had to go back and watch some programs this morning. Just like, oh yeah, that's what we did. I remember it now. Anyway, on that Langors program, we actually made a, a log canoe that, that Phil and Tony went out of water on. Yeah. Great fun. And if you listen to that program, they're talking about the fact that as soon as that wood dries out, you get part of the work. And it's the same with buildings. If you dry that building out like you would for furniture or something, it becomes a much harder job to make the beams and all the rest of it. And you don't want to do that. So you cut, as soon as you cut that tree down, you're cutting it up and you're squaring it up. You're starting to put the mortises in it. And within a few, you know, within six months of that tree, those trees coming down, that building is up and occupied, unless it's a big manor house or something. But for a vernacular building, it's six months, nine months. So that's what we sort of work on when, we're, when we give a day. So if your building's a normal sort of house size building, six months, your building's up. And we've done, we, Sorry, we did, we did research in Winchester Cathedral roles where they've got all the records of, of the management of all the properties owned by the cathedral. And in that, you can see them paying for carpenters and you can see them paying for foresters to get the wood and the carpenters to fix it. And you can see the first rent coming in. So the house is up and being rented. You can see that six months to nine months a year. You can see the change on the size of the house, it, that building being up. So we, we know that basically. We know it's green. And, and you're working for the University of Maryland now, off and on. You're an independent dendrochronologist, but... Um... Yeah, I'm an, I'm an independent dendrochronologist. I've been, been I'm running my own business for a long time. It gives me freedom to do whatever I want. But when I was in England, I was at Oxford University, and that, that university affiliation is really useful. So when I came to America 10 years ago, I basically went to University of Maryland and talked to them about me being a research faculty, which gives me university access to the libraries and computers and all that kind of stuff. So for me, it's a really good resource. And for them, it means like when I finish this Zoom call, I'm doing another Zoom call with the university for the students who are all at home. So, you know, I work I with them, but not full time. Sort of thing. And one of the really exciting things you've been looking at is Mount Vernon. Do you want to tell the English viewers why Mount Vernon is such a big deal in America and what have you found out about it? Yeah, so basically I do, when I was in England, obviously I was doing things like, you know, Tower of London and things like that. So when I came over here, lots of people say to me, you know, this, why are you there? The buildings aren't that old. But, you know, we're all telling stories. Our job's all about making stories and, and improving stories. So when we went to Mount Vernon, which is a really important house here, it's the first president of the new country. It's like, it's like American, the closest they have to royalty, but then tell the Americans that. Yeah. So it's a really important house. And when we went there, the story was that basically this was George Washington, the house that he built. And when we came into Dendro, we actually found in the, in the basement of this house, you could see the fact that the bottom plates, the bottom timbers for the original house his father had built. Wow. So we managed to push the structure back sort of 40 years 
I think 1732, I think, but don't don't quote me on the date. We could basically see his father's house encapsulated in the house that you see today, um, the famous house you see today. So for Dendro Knowledge, that was a great, you know, a, a great sort of advancement of the story of Mount Vernon. And I still, I, that was at this point, 15 years ago, I did that. And I still go back. Basically, I'm on call there. So whenever they find any wood, they ring me up and say, Mick, we found some wood in some certain sort of a wall down or a fire escape or whatever. Somebody's found something, I'll go back and do it for them. So I've been working there literally for 15 years. <laughs> Uh, and extraordinary enough, I think you were saying you're about you're a, you know one of the few dendrochronologists, independent dendrochronologists in the states. Yeah, I'm basically the only one. I'm the only full time dendrochronologist. All the dendrochronologists I've worked at universities, so they're lecturing full time, or they're doing other research, and they do tree rate, they do building dating um, as a sideline sort of thing, or a very small part of their job. But I only do I only do structures. Okay. So I work with like historians across the country, basically. And I'm going to just, you know, sort of ask you to just very briefly, because I remember talking to you about um, different kinds of woods being made and how knowing the tree ring dating from other buildings that have been dated already allows you to sort of bring the two lots of barcodes of tree rings together and match them up that's the best i can do yeah, that's good why is that <laughs> why, what is the deal with all that because so, i know you're quite jealous about your data in some ways you're you know good data yeah my yeah my job is data so what we what we're doing is if you take a sample of wood out of a building well if you get two pieces of wood which are growing at the same time they will record the climate signal um, for that period they're growing. And the way they record it is the width of their rings. On a warm, wet year, you'll get a wide ring. On a drought year, you'll get a narrow ring. Over a long period of time, 50 years plus, that becomes a unique code. So any two trees growing at the same time won't have the same ring widths, but they'll have the same sequence of narrow and wide ring. And that's what we're looking for. So basically, if you know the date of one piece of wood and you can match another one against it, you can transfer the date from the one piece of wood to the other and if you've got bark head, you can say that tree was felled in the summer of 1722 or whatever it might be. And we, we, we had some dates from a village in Somerset, Dunster, of about 1270. Um, yeah. What was interesting about it was that some of the wood had bits of a ring system and another bit had a little bit more of it or a little bit less of it. And you, you don't need the complete set from each building to match up your dates is that right you can you can use sections of one with sections of the other if they match you don't need like the entire bandwidth of the tree no 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 we, that's true sorry yeah so basically what we're trying to do we, we take six to ten samples out of a phase of construction of the building so the oldest part of the house we'll take six to ten samples and what we're looking for is as many samples that can bleed that wood all those samples have to have more than 50 annual rings and if we can't get all the samples complete, that would we'll take other ones which will sort of extend the chronology further back. So the longer the chronology we get, the better. And the sapwood sat sat wood is the sapwood is the is the outside of the tree. It's the outside rings of the tree which are just under the bark, and those basically are still in oak. Particularly, they they are still pumping water up and down the tree. And when we get into that section there, we can start doing things like you know when date ranges and if we got the barcode we can give it a size date <laughs> and can you give us an example i often think you know with you with your little coring machine and drill disappearing up into ancient buildings in america do you ever get quite nervous about what you've got to do and was there a really great result you were able to tell someone that you can talk about that you remember something yeah it's, yeah it's, it's it's a funny one because I was doing the job in Edington, North Carolina, and I, I was there was a guy who basically rented houses. He'd buy up small houses, he would do them up, and he would rent them out. And his builder was was in this house one day. It's a tiny building. It's, it's like 20, 20 feet by fifteen at the most. It's not a small one story sort of building. And the builder start taking the plaster off and realized this timber work looks weird. It's not two by fours it's not modern you know 1930s wood like like all the others in the town it's something different so they call in the, the local arch, the, the county archaeology the equivalent state archaeologists here and they basically said this is something unusual they called me in i did dental chronology 
and we basically found the oldest surviving building in North Carolina from 1719, I think it was. Yeah. And it, it's this tiny building in the back of us. It's not even on the high street. It's like in a back street somewhere. It's probably been moved because these guys move buildings all the time. And it was like, you know, it made national press here. Uh-huh. So <laughs> that was cool. That's a great, that's a great, 1790 is a great date, isn't it? When you think, when, do, when we're, we're Mayflower year now, uh, yes. or, you know, the, the celebration of it. That those early settlements in places like Carolina, what sort of dates are the first settlers coming in? Well, it's not that easy because you have the main settlements, which are sort of, I don't know, Virginia, Virginia, coastal Virginia, Maryland, where St. Mary's, where you, where you went to, and then sort of the Boston area of New England. And basically from those places in New York, you get these people radiating out. So the dating basically slowly expands out from those places. So everywhere you go, the earliest buildings are always later than those coastal towns where people are coming from. Okay. And then you've also got to remember over here, I'm not just looking at English buildings, like in New England sort of English buildings. I'm looking at German buildings, Swedish buildings, um, and loads of other cultures coming in. So um, it's always it's it, yeah, it's always yeah, it's always good. It's good fun. <laughs> and have they asked you to do any boats? Have any boat timbers come up for you to take a look? Yeah, at? I've just done. I've just done three boats, no, four boats in Alexandria. They were they were um, putting a new a new housing complex in with understory car park. And in the 1750s, they'd extended the town rather than the town faced the river and rather than extending the town away from the river they extended the town into the river so they made these huge log cribs which look like 50 foot size uh, log cabins which they filled with rubble and then built on it and in there we found three ships um, and one of them dated so we're in virginia which is near washington dc which is sort of central west coast east coast sorry and the the timbers, that ship, the, the, the ship's called the Indigo, because that's the name of the hotel they were building. The, the ship timbers came from New England. And I know there's two towns where the wood's coming from, and there's two shipyards there. So it came from one of these two shipyards in, this, in the 1740s or something. So ships are really interesting, because you can do this Denver province thing, so you can see where they, they obviously where they sink isn't where they were built, but sometimes you get to see where they were built. So I do ships, I think probably one a year, I guess. I think I, I like the idea of somehow you being the dendro detective. Dis- <laughs> I, you get a phone call, Mick, we've got some timbers in wherever, and off you go and do it. I mean, that must be quite, because the thing I remember about dendro, relatively speaking, compared with C14, it's, it's relatively quick if you've got the right number of rings. How, how, how long does it take to go from rings to date if i don't have any other work on so i did a job the other day where i sampled it on the monday and i the report was out by the wednesday but usually it takes a month because obviously i've got 10 other jobs going at any one time and people shouting at me for this that and the other i, so I, 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 I can i can only give you scientists three days to do anything that's right yeah well, i'm used to that i can love that three days i can do anything in three days but honestly, <laughs> three, good to three days that's okay. it because you're in america now um, yes. Do you have any sense of, of having missed stuff in England or is, is it so exciting in America and your new life there and everything? Do you ever feel you'd like to go back and dig a nice Roman site or a, or a yeah, I, 70 or? Yeah, I, I still have the problem with the archaeologists here like you did when you did the, the, the shoot of St. Mary's. I, and I walk onto sites and I, I pull my hair out. I think, mean, what are you guys doing? I could have done this myself this afternoon. Literally, I was going to take the other day and I was thinking, there's about eight people working. And I'm thinking, no, I'm now 56. You know, when we're doing the show, I was like in my, my mid-20s. I still could do it quicker than these eight young kids doing this thing. I could literally just go in there and just do, the, do it for them on my own in the afternoon. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, we had some very nice experiences, I should say, in Maryland with the American archaeologists there. But I do remember a sense of, time passing before my eyes as they took out the long handled hoe and sort of <laughs> and it made this sort of long drawn out sort of grating noise and they yeah. did one of those have a look do an- i mean they gradually got you know speeded up a bit but uh, a clear yeah, i'm feeling very different here because there isn't much history and 
the way the way digs work you know the people you were working with how many years ago it was 20 20 years ago that you did that shoot are still working on that site today yeah you know when you'd never get that where here people go to one site and that'll be their whole career yeah so there's a different scale of speed also the information they want is very different you know in england there's so much victorian if you tried to record everything victorian england you would never you'd never get to the you never get to the interesting stuff so it's a very different different world what would your fantasy dendro or archaeology site be if you if you had a chance to stick your core in one piece of archaeology or somewhere does anywhere come to mind oh i'd love to have done that or i would want to do that or does anything well, no, I no, I've actually I, I haven't got I've done some great things in middle. The stuff we done time team was pretty amazing. I've worked in Egypt, I've worked in the Caribbean. So no, I haven't got anywhere I wanted to go. I it's a lot of places I want to go. I've been and I've been amazed. Actually the best archaeology we've done is in somebody's back garden because you get these people who are so excited, you know, the Ripchester program. That guy is so excited about what he's got in his garden. And I actually prefer those kind of digs where the locals are involved and the other one we did was the, the Soho Manufactory we did in yeah, Birmingham. Uh, Birmingham, England, yeah. England, there was like 200 people came out to see what we were doing. They were so excited. And like the dig I was on last week in, in Maryland, it was in a, a poor African-American neighborhood, which is, they're trying to sort of stop it. They're trying to sort of save the area. And basically we had about 50 local people coming and they were really interested in what was happening, why we were doing it. And I find that much more exciting than I want to go and dig pyramid, although I've done it. Yeah. Um, going back to Nevis, um, uh, of which I have memories of um, the Time Team theme being played on tin drums and a rather <laughs> riotous end of shoot party on a beach, which we won't, right. we won't go into, but I think the photographs exist somewhere. Um, I also remember scuba diving with Mick. I mean, you were around for a lot of Mick's time with, with Time Team. You and Mick have met at Bristol. You've known him for a long time. What, what are your memories yeah. of Mick? Oh, I think Mick was unique, totally and utterly unique. The memory he had, the stuff he had seen, every subject you talked about he could add to. He'd either seen it, he'd read something about it. He just had that brain that just sucked that kind of information in. And I was talking to my wife. My wife was taught by him at, you know, at Bristol University. And she was saying that was one of the things that made him such a great teacher was because he just had that knowledge. You could just talk to anything to him. Then he had something to say about it. Fantastic. I miss him so much. Yeah. Well, I think that's a rather nice place to end, Mick. Um, thank you very much for a little insight. Uh, we will be coming to you to know more about your career in dendrochronology in the future. And, right, and okay. if you find something that you can share with us, it would be great to hear about it. And right. I hope you stay well. Best wishes to all our American friends out there, particularly in Maryland. I always remember one thing in Maryland. Stop, stop, stop. It's not called Maryland. It's Maryland. Oh, sorry. Oh, crikey. Right, Maryland. Um, <laughs> Uh, and the thing I remember from that was the tooth facet. We did a okay. burial there. And yes. there, there was a gut, we found a skull, and in the guy's skull with his teeth and everything, there was the little shape where he kept his hickory pipe yeah. or whatever it was. Yeah. And and I remember discussing the idea that in when the when the first people arrived there. That first winter they called the seasoning period or something. And yeah. literally 40% of them died. I, when I first came here, the first two years, I struggled. I couldn't go outside. I had to stay in air-conditioned rooms. Yeah. I could not go outside in the summer. The summer here was brutal. I live, I live 30, 30 miles away from where you were digging in St. Mary's City, 30, 40 miles okay. away. So I, I, I live that climate. It's brutal. I know. It, it, I had one day. I was out at, a, at an art show. I fainted, and the paramedics had to take me into an air-conditioned room and feed me water because it was so hot. Oh. So I'm not surprised they died. I really am not. <laughs> it's been awful. I can't imagine doing it. Well, I can't imagine doing it. That's awful. And thinking about that Mayfly generation, I remember 
a sort of slight shiver at the thought of those people leaving England, leaving European cities, making a journey which they knew they couldn't come back from uh, to the new world, and then having the guts and resources to make it through, um, in some cases with help from the Native Americans. And, and it, it's a really, it is an incredible story about America, those early settlement days, which met St. Mary's City um, uh, was part of. Um, final thought, if people are thinking about watching Nevis this weekend, we join together and watch this, why would you recommend watching Nevis to them? What, what, what's good about the show? I think Nevis is a good story because it tells you a little bit about how England got so rich. You know, the empire and all the rest of it. You know, the UK made a huge amount of money off the back of slave slavery. And I don't think we're told enough about that. And I think that program gives you a glimpse of that. And I think that's a good educational thing to do. Yeah. And when we're going through, I think it's Black History Month at the moment here. And the yeah. Black Lives Matter movement is, is, is well represented over here. So that's a, that's a really important point for me. Mick, thank you very much indeed. Lovely to see you again. Kind of miss the long hair. I know. I, I couldn't believe how long my hair was. But I was <laughs> you got long hair. That's crazy. I just thought you looked like John the Baptist or something. <laughs> I, I did look just like John the Baptist. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> Mick, lovely to talk as always, and uh, we'll talk again soon. And stay well, and best wishes to you and the family. Excellent. Love you, mate. See you again. See ya.